Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another Thursday night YouTube class live every Thursday night from 6.30 to 8 o'clock-ish. Um, starting, um, we started the Thursday classes in June. We're going to take the Thursday classes through the summer. Leave your Saturday nights for barbecues and grill outs and vacations and beach time because that's what I want to do on Saturday nights. Uh, and we'll be live on Thursday nights from here on out, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Very excited about tonight because tonight... We are drinking some really spectacular wines. Um, at least I think so. That's why I chose them, and I hope you think so as well. Uh, and the theme of this is the third class of older things that was the theme of the entire month of May. It is my birthday month. Uh, tomorrow is my birthday, and so I just chose this month to celebrate all things older. So the first class we did was older vines and how vine age changes how wines might taste, why vine age is important, what is considered old when you're talking about old vines. The last class we did last week um, was old favorites. So I did some of my wines that I have been going back to um, that were old favorites of mine from years and years ago that I still continue to really like and enjoy uh, and go back to even if they're different vintages or different crews or anything like that. It's um, old old favorites uh, that, that are always staples. This class is old wines. So it's the wines themselves that are old. The minimum age that we are drinking from today is 10 years old. Um, and we're going all the way back to 26 years old uh, for a California Cabernet, 26 years old. So very, very excited about these wines and sharing them with you tonight. We're gonna talk a lot about some chemistry. Um, what is actually chemically changing in the bottle itself to make the, the flavor change, the color change, the aromatics change. How is this happening? Um, what wines can age the best? How you should store your wines too to make sure that they can age uh, the best possible way that you can control for any variables that you can actually control for. And um, and then we're just gonna taste some really badass wines. So if you're tuned in live, I'd love to hear who you are, where you're coming from. I see some people are already chatting up in the chat box. Uh, if you can't access the chat box, it's probably because you're not signed in. So make sure you're signed into the YouTube um, email address that's connected to uh, your YouTube so that you can participate in the chat room. I'd love to uh, get your comments, get your questions, and get your uh, tasting notes on these wines. Kira and Rob, hello, great to see y'all. Yes, this is not my apartment. Uh, if you could tell, I'm at a dear friend's house, um, and um, this is a beautiful cellar behind me. It's just absolutely stunning. So I look forward to, after this class, um, perusing the cellar to see what else to open up throughout the evening. So uh, yes, this is not my my tiny little apartment in uh, Norfolk. So Rick Morrison from Williamsburg. Hello, hello. Great to see you. Julia, I mean, sorry, Gloria and Angela. Great to see y'all as well. Thank you for the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. Lisa, great to see you. Very excited to have you all here tonight. Um, and we are going to do a little bit of a weird uh, progression in terms of the tasting. I went back and forth like four different ways that I could do the progression, like which wines do we taste when? And I have finally settled on <laughs> this. If you got this in the email, um, um, then great. If you've already poured the white wine, you know, just grab another glass or something like that. We're actually going to pour this wine first. This is the Cosimo Torino. This is their Salice Salentino. That is the specific region in Apulia, uh, where, where we're drinking from. That's the heel of the boot of Italy. This is a blend of Malvasia Nera and Negramaro. So Malvasia Nera is just about 10% of this blend. Negramaro is about 90% of this blend. This is their 2011 vintage. This is actually current release. It wasn't like hanging out of my wine shelf for five years. This is actually their current release, which is so cool um, that uh, people are doing that. After we taste this wine, so go ahead and pour yourself a glass of that one. Um, after we taste this wine, we are going to be going to the white wines. We're going to go to white burgundy next. So normally we start with white wines, but for the reason that is this complicated tasting of very, very different flavor profiles of all four of these wines, I wanted to break up the, 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 the Italian red and the next two reds with the white burgundy. So we are drinking next 
if you uh, don't have these wines, this is what we're drinking. This is the Jacques Sommets. This is the Mecon Boussier. Um, it's the specific region in the Meconnais district of Burgundy, France that we're in. This is their Mont Brisson, also a 2011 vintage for this wine. It's 100% Chardonnay from mm -hmm. Burgundy, France. The third wine that we're going to be tasting is Taken from Granite. This is their 1995 vintage. This is the Soleil um, um, bottling of the Renaissance Vineyard, and that is in the North Yuba area in the Sierra foothills of California. So not Napa, Sonoma. We're uh, further, further inland, further north, higher elevation to get to the Sierra foothills to get to this wine. 1995 because so that's gonna be the oldest wine we're gonna be drinking then we're gonna jump back to italy to finish everything off with um, and we're gonna be drinking our pepe probably one of my favorite nebbiola producers they're not from piedmont they're from lombardi so lombardi the area specifically is Valtellina. this is their superiore this is their reserva so extended oak aging this is 20, 2007 vintage the sicella is the crew and the single vineyard is Roche Rosé. So that is the lineup of tonight and the order in which we are going to be drinking. I apologize for the confusion of uh, doing red wine first and then white wine next, but thanks for hanging in with me. So Brad and Lori, great to see y'all as well. Uh, Leslie, Renzi, Sarah, and uh, Karen here. Um, great to see y'all as well. Um, my computer is pretty far away from me, and um, the chat box, I need to zoom in so I can read everybody's uh, comments better without having to jump in. So, all right, let's dive in. If you haven't already, go ahead and pour yourself a big old glass of the um, Cosimo Torino. This is the Celice Salentino 2011. <laughs> What I think is fascinating about this wine too, just to give a little bit of history, if you read the tags on the back, if you didn't have these wines or didn't read the tags, I'll just tell you the story. When I first was getting into wine, I, like most people, liked the smoother, more like rounder styles of California uh, red wines. And I thought red wines from Italy tended to be a little too bitter, a little bit too sour, a little bit too tart. And I just like, it wasn't my thing. And I remember telling, telling uh and i'm like 21 years old and working at a wine store and i was like oh italian red wines are just like not my thing and the guy was like what how can you say that there's 20 different states in italy hundreds and hundreds of different regions within all of those states over 1500 indigenous grape varieties alone and like infinite amounts of styles you could try a new italian rind every day for the rest of your life and still not try them all so you can't say you don't like Italian red wines. It's my mission now to make you like them. And so we started opening up a lot of Italian wines on a regular basis. And it was a wine from this area, Salice Salentino, in the heel of the boot of Italy in the state called Puglia, or Apulia, if it's uh, written in Italian. And that was like, oh my gosh, I do love Italian red wine. So it's like my first aha moment for Italian red wines. And it was probably... Um, um, you know, closer to this vintage. Um, well, no, this is still, uh, never mind, never mind. I'm not going to date myself there. This is definitely not the vintage that I would, I would have been tasting there. I probably would have been tasting in 2003 or, or five or such with that. But anyways, it's always, um, a walk down memory lane whenever I try Salice Salentino, so it just brings back a lot of thoughts about how I got into wine and, and what, and, and what allowed me to continue expanding my horizons. And it was often, anytime that I, I saw those significant expansions of horizons, it was people in my life that were opening up wines and sharing them with me to really make me see like, oh, that's what this wine should taste like, or didn't know wine could taste like this. And so that's kind of why I do these classes, to try for wines that maybe you wouldn't have tried otherwise. So thank you all for being brave with me. Um, and trying these great wines. So as we taste this, go ahead, just dive right in. Um, you don't have to wait to taste this wine or sample this. I'd love to know your tasting notes in the chat room, but I do wanna chat a little bit just at the beginning, especially about some things that change with age and we'll continue talking about it. But I'll get some of the science stuff out of the way while we uh, are not too inebriated so that we can uh, we can uh, we can pick up on all the science still at the beginning. So. Wine is going to chemically change in the bottle with age. It doesn't matter if you have a screw cap, 
If you have a plastic cork, if you have a real cork, it doesn't matter, the wine is going to change. The type of enclosure will change the way it ages based on the amount of oxygen that it allows um, into the bottle. So there's a few different factors that go into why wines change and how they change with age. One of them is oxygen. So a real cork, so pull this open right here. This is a real cork right here. It is not a composite cork, it's not plastic, it's not a synthetic material, uh, it's, not, um, it's not any of those factors. It's a real cork from a cork tree and they're porous. And so it will allow micro amounts of oxygen into the wine very, very slowly throughout the years as the wine ages. And that's gonna, that's going to change the wine. Wine will change with, now there's actually still, science really hasn't really shown how screw cap wines will age because they haven't been around long enough and especially they haven't been used by premium winemakers long enough to really see how it changes. But there is a tiny amount, like tinier than corks will allow, a tiny amount of oxygen that a screw cap will allow into the wine. So it is possible to age your wine with screw caps. Um, when you see those premium wines from Australia that are still aged in screw caps, like don't worry, your wine will, will develop. It'll just develop differently than if it had a real cork. Um, and uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see the, the, the science and as it's developing as we continue to change the way we are sealing our bottles. So oxygen is one of the factors that's going to chemically change your wine. Time is one of those too. So time is going to basically change it regardless of the enclosure. So even if no oxygen is affecting your wine at all, the amount of time that the wine is aging will chemically change the bottle, the flavor of the wine without any effect of oxygen at all. So time is one of those factors. Temperature is another factor. So the increase of temperature, if wines are stored too warm, it will increase or accelerate the rate that the wines itself are aging. So they've actually done experiments to see if they can prematurely age wines. Like, hey, we want to taste this wine, what it's going to taste like at 10 years old, but we want to drink it now. And so we're going to like slowly just increase the temperature, not to the point of actually cooking the wine, to see if we can basically get it to taste the exact same way as it will in 10 years, but at five years. And the science uh, has not proven that that's possible. So you are going to chemically change the wine, but you're also going to degrade the quality quite a bit too. But temperature is one of the factors. Light is also a factor, so that is why these days, um, bottles are much darker. The glass is much darker. Um, and so people who are making wines that they think are, are worthy of aging, that you should age, that you can age, that they're encouraging you to age, they will put extra money into putting their wines into darker glass bottles to prevent some of the light from prematurely aging your wine. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Going to just block that person. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Every now and then I get some uh, spammers here. Um, uh, sorry. I just have to report this so we don't have to handle it, and uh, we are good to go. All right. Sorry for that. If uh, anyone in the future ever wants to report anyone so I don't have to go through those steps in the middle of the video, then that would be great. Um, all right, so um, we talked about oxygen, temperature, light, humidity also will change the, the way the wines age. That's why cellars should be about 65 to 85% humidity. You don't want it too dry. It will dry out the cork. You don't want it too damp. It encourages too much mold. So humidity is a factor. Vibrations are also a factor too. So say you um, live right by a railroad track and if your wines are not kind of sealed with some like foam or if there's not any sort of thing to kind of absorb some of those micro vibrations, your wine will develop faster than if it had none of those vibrations on a regular basis. So really fascinating to see how all of those factors go into it. But here's how some of those things change. So what are we gonna see? What is going to change in wine as uh, the wine ages? 
One, the color is going to change. We're going to see this, uh, especially when we get to the Cabernet. It will look like no other Cabernet you've had unless you drink older Cabernets. Red wine loses color with age. The pigments actually get absorbed by tannins that fall out. We'll talk about that in a little bit and uh, become sediment in the wine as the wine ages. So red wine becomes from red or purple hues. Those pigments start to be absorbed by the tannins and will fall out. And so your wine will look more brickish or tawny or garnet in the wine world as we call it, but a brown coloring uh, to the wine. White wine gains color with age. And that, uh, so you're gonna get from clear, paler straw, yellow tones to much more golden colors. So possibly, you know, if you, if you let a white wine and a red wine age long enough, they will actually become very similar in color if you let, let both of them age long enough. So just like an apple, once you cut it, then the acids literally start to oxidize. Those acid compounds of the apple start to oxidize and chemically change with oxygen. And that is the coloring, the pigment that we see that turns brown. The same thing is happening to the acid compounds in our white wines. And so that's why it gets darker with age, but it's literally the pigments that are being absorbed by tannins and changing with oxygen that the red wines lose color with age. So that's one way wines change. Speaking of tannins, Tannins also change quite a bit as wine ages. And we just talked about the tannins falling out um, and becoming sediment. Now, sometimes you have sediment in young wine. It's usually just a wine that wasn't filtered or fined. And so you're gonna have the basically grape skin and um, used yeast particles. Um, that is, is found in young wines all the time. That's not falling out tannins. Even a red wine, even if it was fined and filtered, if it's aged long enough, you could have some sediment in it. And it all just depends on the type of grape it is and how it was made and how old it is. And here's what happens. I think this is probably the most fascinating thing that I learned in the last few years about how wines age. So, uh, uh, so you've probably heard me talk about it before. But tannins are these compounds, right? They're these chemical compounds. It's technically called a polymer. Um, and so just imagine that these are, these are tannins, my fist. When they're young, they're just like us and they're vibrant and tons of energy. Just think about like your, your kids or your nieces and nephews or any of your friends' kids or something like that. They're just like running around and you always think, oh my gosh, I wish I had that much energy. That's what tannins are doing when they're very young. They are charged, they have um, an ionic charge, and so they're constantly repelling against each other like magnets when you do the same, the same side of a magnet. So they're repelling against each other and always kind of like bouncing off each other and like staying suspended in the wine um, when it is young. So they're very energetic and, and staying suspended. During the aging process, and this happens with time, has nothing to do with oxygen, just strictly time, then during that aging process, they slowly will just lose their charge, just like we lose our energy as we get older. And as they lose their charge, they start being like, okay, well, I'm not so repelled by you anymore. We can link up and be friends. Finally, they start linking up into these longer chains of all of these tannin polymers kind of linking up together. And then they become too heavy to stay suspended in the air. So they'll actually sink to the bottom of the bottle. So whether it's on its side, they're gonna sink to the bottom and, and rest along the side. So those older bottles, you can see all along the side of the bottle as the wine was stored there, this layer of the sediment that's kind of like hanging out on the bottom, those are fallen out tannins. What is happening when it's doing that is they're absorbing some of the pigments like we talked about, which changes the color of red wine, but they're also releasing the things that they were bound to when they were younger. So when they're bound, when they're, when they're younger and they have this charge, then they're linking up and chemically binding with these certain ester molecules. Esters are the things that we smell, the chemical molecules when you swirl the wine, smell it, what you're smelling, that's esters that are volatile, vaporized, that's connecting to our nose and allowing us to smell it. There's loads of different ester compounds in all of our different wines that change based on the grape and how it was made. So certain esters are always there, 
but we can't smell them because they cannot be released into the air because when they're younger, they're bound with those tannins. The tannins like, I'm young, I'm hanging out with Esther. And so we're, 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 we're together. Then as I get older, it's like, all right, Esther, I'm too old for you. I'm gonna release you into the world so you can do your thing. And I'm gonna bind up with all of my tannin friends. So as wine changes, you start to be able to smell different things. And part of the reason why you smell those different things is because those esters, those aromatic compounds that were always there in the wine are now finally released and able to be evaporated and uh, get into your nose and tell us what we're smelling. So that is to me one of the most fascinating things about how wine ages, that, that those aromatics were always there they're just finally free and living their best life and living their single life and, uh, and, and able to escape the glass and, uh, and tell us what we're smelling. So really, really fascinating. What is also happening when those tannins are linking up and binding and forming those long chains is it's changing the total surface area of the tannins. So when tannins are young and they're, and they're suspended and they're singular, then you have the surface tension of the entire tannin molecule that will bind to your gums and give that serious drying sensation in your mouth, that totally just that cotton ball effect. And that's because it's binding to the water molecules in your mouth and absorbing them, literally drying out your mouth. Well, as the tannins get older and they link up and form these long chains of tannins, that changes and reduces the overall surface area of those tannins, of those polymers, and thus it is no longer able to have the same intense effect on your mouth. So that is why old wines smell different and that is why older wines also are softer. You're never gonna get harsher tannins with age. You always get softer tannins with age. And that happens with time, not necessarily oxygen. So really fascinating how those tannins change. Um, thank you all for listening to that uh, intense discussion of the chemistry of tannins. That'll be the last little bit. We'll talk about this wine. We'll talk more about uh, the chemistry of how wines age as we get along, but I don't want to do this wine a disservice and not talk about it. So this is Casa Torino from uh, the area of Salice Salentino. It's about 90% um, uh, Negro Amaro and 10% Nalvesia Nera. So I'm sure those are all your favorite grapes. You get them all the time. They're literally pretty much only grown in this area of Puglia, nowhere else even in Italy, or the rest of the world, virtually. Obviously, there's always some more exp experimental winemakers that are uh, playing around with different grapes. But pretty much, this is where 99.999% of all of those two grapes are grown. So it's really interesting. This is just about 100 meters above sea level. So we're not that high in elevation. And the heel of the boot of Italy goes straight to the Mediterranean. So we are warm climate loads of sun, these like south facing vineyards are just like the sun is just baking the grapes all uh, all day long during the growing season. And so often these wines can be pretty like raisinated and rich and dense and extracted. And um, But this is a little bit more of a reserved style um, than other Salice Salentinos that I've had, but you're always gonna have that a little bit rounder fruit. And I think that's why I loved it so much when I first fell in love with this wine. Tell me what y'all are smelling and tasting and experiencing this wine. Is this a uh, region or a type of wine that you would typically gravitate towards? Or what, um, what is your experience with this one? And if you're drinking it with some food, tell me what you're eating it with and if it pairs well. So, hi Ryan, great to see you. Glad that you're here. Um, can you elaborate on tartrite crystals? Fabulous. See, um, have you seen them more common in older white wines? I know they commonly occur when it's cold, but other situations. Yes, yeah, so in white wine specifically, um, if the wine was stored for a long time at a certain temperature, usually a very cold temperature, then you get those wine diamonds, they call them, or tartrites or crystals in your glass that almost look like the same thing as sediment in a red wine, but it's white wine and they have no pigment at all. And they're just like a crunchy texture. They don't really have a taste at all. What's happening is tartaric acid 
is literally becoming crystallized and it's basically unprocessed cream of tartar. So if you take those crystals and process them, you can actually turn it into cream of tartar and bake with it if you like. But it's just acid compounds that start to crystallize at a certain temperature. So if you do a cold stabilization during the fermentation process when you're making the white wine, it'll form the, all those crystals in the big tanks and then the wine is filtered off of those crystals and bottles so you don't get them. If your wine does not go through that cold stabilization and it goes straight into bottling, those, tar um, those tartaric acid compounds are still in the wine. And um, if you store it in your fridge at you know, 35, 37 degrees for a long time, usually six months or more, you'll start to see those crystals develop as that tartaric um, acid um, crystallizes. So doesn't really ha matter how old the wine was, it's just about how the wine was made and if it was filtered off those tartaric um, acid compounds, but great question there. So um, Rick says, I read that Sauvignon can age better than most whites. Yes, when we, when we drink the next wine, we're gonna talk about what white wines age well and why, and Sauvignon is definitely one of those. So Sauvignon is region in the Loire Valley, 100% Chenin Blanc, that's the only grape that they grow there that can legally be called Sauvignon. And um, they can age so beautifully. I just recently tried a 15 year old seven years that blew my mind. So um, yes, absolutely. Lori Carmone says, smoke leather and an earthy nose. Yeah, I love the smoke call. There is, um, there's loads of this like campfire smoke and charred fruits on there. So all the fruits that might be like fresh and vibrant when this wine was first released um, or first put into bottle. Now that it's got 10 years age on it, those fruits have started to become more dried out, a little bit more rustic and um, absolutely, totally agree with you on that. So as wines age, one of the things that change is just the flavor profiles of the things that you're tasting. So all the fruit, the herbs and stuff like that, that would be considered primary flavors. They change from more the fresh, brown, juicy, even jammy style, and they'll start to become more dried as you go on. So uh, floral petals might be fresh when the wine is in is young, and it starts to become like more potpourri and dried floral petals as the wine ages. Same thing with herbs. You could get those fresh herbs, like just picking the garden, versus dried herbs as the wine ages. Fruit same thing. So as the wine smells and tastes more dried in terms of the fruit, floral, and herbaceous characteristics, that is an indication that the wine is a little bit older. So great question. So Rick, uh, Rick says, are the tartaric acid crystals more prevalent in acidified wines? Not, uh, not so. So tartaric acid is uh, natural to the grape. Usually when wines are acidified, they're using citric acid because it is very hard to actually add tartaric acid or even malic acid after the fermentation process is done or during the fermentation process. So usually when wines are acidified, meaning the winemaker is deciding that this wine isn't tart enough, it's not vibrant enough, it's actually citric acid that is being added and those compounds do not crystallize like tartaric acid compounds do. Great question, uh, love all of these nerds in here with all of these questions about acid compounds. Um, really, really fascinating. So I got to taste this one. I've been talking so much about the science that I've forgotten to taste and we've got three more wines to go. Hmm. I love this wine. And to me, killer value too um, shows those those more tertiary flavors come out. So you've got primary flavors like we talked about. Secondary flavors, you know, start to come out at about five to seven years old. Then after that, we start to see the development of tertiary flavors like leather and spices, nutty flavors, fatty or waxy or oily flavors, um, um, like um, burning sugar on the oven, that caramelization or caramelized onions, all of those things would be tertiary. Uh, flavors. That's a very hard word for me to say. So if I stumble that over that in the in the uh, the, the rest of this class, forgive me. Um, then 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 that's what happens. Um, the flavor profiles as the wine ages. So hopefully y'all are digging this wine. I really would love this with some like grilled Italian sausages with um, you know roasted um, 
or saute peppers and onions, some spicy mustard, um, just right off the grill, a little bit of that char on it would be the perfect way, I think, to enjoy this wine. If you notice the color on this, like we talked about, the, um, the color of red wine changes as, the, as it ages, and you definitely see a little bit more of that, those garnet colors. Not quite just straight up brown yet, but a little bit more brickish with, uh, with ruby undertones. So we also see um, like some goldish flecks in there. So younger Salice Salentinos are definitely gonna be much more like purple in flavor. Um, I mean, not in flavor, sorry, also in flavor, but really in color, so. All right. Well, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and try the white burgundy. So if you're using the same glass, maybe just do a tiny little bit of that white burgundy, rinse it in your glass. Don't rinse out the glass with water. That changes the pH balance of the wine, of the wine glass, and you, it will be hard to smell the next wine. So if uh, you don't have the next glass, just go ahead and pour that tiny little bit, rinse it around, dump it out or drink it. And, uh, and then pour the next glass so you're not getting a rosé wine uh, in there. So, again, yeah, this, um, this is Jacques Somme's. It's a husband and wife team, so it's listed online as Jacques and Nathalie uh, Somme's, but on the bottle, just Jacques Somme's. So um, I think her name should be on there somewhere. On other bottlings, her name is on there too, so I don't know if she stepped up her, her influence on the process in later years or not. But this is from the area of Mekonais, the southern district of Burgundy, France, specifically Mekonbossier, which is right by Puy Fuissé. And um, this is their Mont Brisson labeling. So 2011 vintage, same vintage as the Salice Salentino that we were just drinking. And let's check out the color of this wine to see if this wine has got significant increase of coloring, or increase of those copper coloring specifically. So make sure whenever you're looking at color of the wine, don't just hold it up to the room because you're gonna pick up the color from all around the room, which is a lot of golds and browns in here. So my, the pigment on this wine looks pretty darn golden on this wine. So take your uh, piece of white paper, maybe a plate or a napkin. If you're at a restaurant, hold it on its side and look straight through that's how you're gonna see a better, truer indication of what the pigment is, what the actual coloring is of this wine. This wine is definitely getting to that yellow category, but still not even golden. So um, the older wine gets uh, for white wine, the more golden it's going to become. I don't have any sediment in here. I just have a piece of cork from where I opened the wine, um, but I don't get any sediment or or tartrites, uh, crystallized tartrites wine diamonds in this particular wine. Um, yeah, so part of the reason why this wine doesn't have a really intense gold coloring is it only was fermented partially in oak. Um, the rest was fermented in uh, stainless steel, and so we don't have as much of that oak giving oxidative coloring and oak coloring, both the oak and the oxygen during that fermentation process or aging process in barrel will add pigment, add those yellow golden tones to a wine. Because we don't have all of this wine being aged in newer oak or extended oak uh, or all of it being aged in oak, because of that, just partial oak, then that is why we're still seeing a pretty vibrant pigment. I'm even getting some, um, you know, some yellow and, and uh, like the, the undertones of this wine are more yellow rather than golden. So it's still showing that this, this, this wine is, is, is not old yet. It's just, it's just on the brink of um, maturing. Let's get our noses in here and uh, tell me what you're smelling. So this is uh, Chardonnay, 100%, uh, but it is not undergoing malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation, remember we were talking about acid compounds, and there's three main acid compounds in wine. 90% of the acid compounds in wine, uh, in, in, in the actual grapes, um, are tartaric acid and malic acid. And then citric acid is kind of 
very small percent in there, sometimes added to the wine like we talked about during the winemaking process. So malic acid is, think of Granny Smith green apples, that flavor profile, that really tart green flavor um, that you sometimes get in wine. Malolactic fermentation is kind of a weird misnomer because it's not really a secondary fermentation process. It's really just a conversion process that some white wines go through, all red wines go through, because if the wine hangs out on the pumice or the, um, you know, all the, the skins of the grape, the yeast, the lees is the yeast, if it hangs out there after the fermentation process, the primary fermentation process is done, what you have is, what, and, and red wines hang out longer, sometimes three to four to five to six weeks, white wines a much shorter period of time. What you have is this secondary conversion process that changes these malic acids into lactic acids. Think lactic acids are basically the acids we get from milk, lactic, lactose, milk, and that's gonna give those creamier components to the wine. So all red wines undergo this malolactic conversion process. Only some white wines do. And those are the white wines that would generally benefit more from this uh, longer extended aging time on, on the lees. And Chardonnay is one of those. So some winemakers choose to kind of push the wine through that process by leaving it on the lees and keeping it at a certain temperature. Some winemakers choose to like hands up in the air, like whatever happens, happens. So every vintage might be a little bit different. And some winemakers are gonna want to not let that happen because they wanna preserve the vibrancy and freshness of this wine. This wine did not undergo malolactic conversion and that's what keeps it much crisper and more vibrant on this wine rather than those like buttery textures of certain Chardonnays, especially like the California style. So tell me what you're thinking about this wine. What I find so fascinating about this wine is that even though it's 10 years old, it still could age for another five to 10 years. And this is just from the Maconese district. So this is what really good Chardonnay can do when it's, when it's made well and the, and the vineyards are tended well and the, the wine is made in a high quality way. Chardonnay can last for years and years and years. Some of the uh, most sought after white wines in the entire world, um, arguably the most sought after white wines in the entire world um, that are not dessert wines or fortified are uh, Chardonnay from the Burgundy district. Typically from the Northern areas, um, uh, more Grand Cru vineyards, but what I love so much is this is like this like little diamond in the rough of um, a really beautiful Chardonnay that, that doesn't cost a fortune that could age for a long time. So, mm. You can tell that it hasn't undergone any malolactic fermentation because you still get those wild apple notes on the wine. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. I just got so excited about that wine, forgot to swallow it all the way. Um, so <clears throat> as um, one of my favorite, I, uh, one of my favorite components of tasting sh good Chardonnay is these like wild farm apple qualities that come in certain white burgundies uh, and certain other Chardonnays from around the world. Though I've only had a few ex experiences with Chardonnays that have these flavor profiles if it's not in Burgundy, France. And I, I'm really, really enjoying, yes, this apple juice or apple cider, um, these almost like yellow crab apples, if that was a thing uh, on this wine. And it's one of my favorite things about white burgundy that doesn't go through any malolactic fermentation has minimal oak. It's just really vibrant. It's really fresh. It's really juicy. It shows none of those tertiary flavors yet. It's really interesting that the, the first red wine that we had actually showed more of those tertiary flavors um, more of those developing flavors. It showed its age more than this white wine did. And here is one of the factors that preserves wine, so to say, or helps wine not, um, not age too quickly. So the pH balance of the wine will affect how quickly the wine matures and sometimes pushes it past its prime and past its, um, you know, into its elderly stage from its um, maturation in the prime and the wine will start to go downhill. 
And a lot of it has to do with pH. So the higher the pH, meaning the lower the acid levels in the wine, and that's all of the acid compounds, right, um, is, is going to accelerate the aging process. Um, it is, uh, it changes the way the oxidative effects of the wine happens. So a higher pH or lower acid level will allow oxidation to happen quicker in wine. So whether it's white or red. Now that should mean, right, that like white wines, generally speaking, have a lower pH, so higher levels of acidity than red wines. So why don't all white wines age better? Well, that's just one component of how wines age. And so when you're going to age wine, the other components like phenolic compounds that happens when oak aging, the phenols of um, both the grape skins themselves and the oak that the wine was aged in act as preservatives to also prevent oxidation from happening. So typically red wines are going to have more phenolics than white wines, but white wines have a lower pH or higher, P, uh, higher level of acidity. The concentration of dissolved oxygen also changes too. So say this bottle right here, um, at a bottling facility, I fill up the bottle with the wine and then I'm gonna put the cork right in it. So that leaves a little bit of the oxygen on the top which becomes dissolved throughout the wine. So that concentration, so how much oxygen was allowed to be in the bottle before I put the cork on, will also change how the wine ages uh, in the bottle or how quickly it oxidizes. So a lot of winemakers now are like spritzing inert gas, meaning inactive gas, like argon um, that's used in the Corbin, before they put the cork in it to make sure that there is no oxygen at all in, in there, so to prevent oxidation from happening a little bit more. Um, Rick says on this wine, very ripe, overripe apple, a little creme brulee. Yes, now that you mention it, apple cider. Okay, cool, I love it, I love it. Um, this is just a husband and wife team. These, this is a half of a hectare vineyard, um, and a hectare is about 2.5 acres. So about, um, what is that, 1.25 uh, acres is this entire area. So a little tiny production of this wine, about 50-year-old vines, and um, again, just partial oak aging on this, and none of that malolactic fermentation on this wine. So I am... I am really enjoying this wine, especially at the price, because white burgundy that can age, you pay a pretty penny for it, and um, and by a pretty penny, I mean like you can spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars a bottle uh, very, very easily on um, on higher-end white burgundy. So when I can find a wine that's affordable, that tastes delicious, even at 10 years old, I am all about it. So by the way, I got the last two and a half cases of this wine that is available. So if you'd like some more, please let me know. Um, I sold a case for this this event, but we'll have a, we'll have about a case and a half left. Maybe just a case, because I'm gonna keep some. Um, so let me know if you would like some more, because I have the last in Virginia that's available. All right, really wanna chat about these um, next two red wines, because they're so <laughs> incredible and so interesting. Um, history-wise, too, and what was actually in our glass. So we're going to show the oldest wine of our lineup next. And that oldest wine here, taken from granite, is the name of the actual bottling. It has this very, like, rustic sticker on it that looks like the sticker itself is 26 years old. It is not, and I'll explain why it's not. This, uh, uh, this wine it has a lot of really, really funky history to it. So go ahead and pour yourself a glass of that whenever you're ready. Um, again, if you're using the same glass as that Chardonnay, totally fine. You might just want to do a small splash of this next wine, kind of like reset the glass so some of those apple cider characteristics or aromatics aren't going into the next wine. Um, if I, I'm curious to know before we go on to this, um, has anyone, is this, for anyone, is this the oldest wine that they might have tasted before? Have you ever tasted a wine that was 25, 26 years old or more? I'm uh, very curious to know. I remember the first time I tried an older wine. It was uh, not my thing, just like... 
just like anything, when we first try it, we're like, oh, I'm not so sure about this. And then, and then you start to appreciate it and understand it. And um, now I'm really digging um, older wines and, um, and, and trying to see how, 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 um, how they age. So Angela, oldest here, awesome. So this is the oldest wine, I'm so, so, so happy. Really excited to be able to share this with you then. Pour yourself a glass of that. We're not gonna agitate this wine a whole lot. Of wines as they age, those aromatics, those esters that are all now released and stuff like that and newer, they do become more delicate. So there is a reason that you decant older wines and that's usually to remove the wine from sediment. So say I have this bottle and all those tannins that have fallen out and collected as sediment on the bottom. Um, if the wine was stored on its side and I just pull it out of the cellar and open it up right away, then that's going to stir up all of that sediment in it. And I'm going to try and like remove the wine from the sediment. So I can pour the wine into a decanter and leave that last little ounce in the, uh, in the bottle kind of leave the rest of those particles in the bottle. And then as the wine sits in the decanter, the sediment also goes down to the bottom. And so you never pour that last little bit of an older wine because you're just gonna get grit in your mouth. Um, the problem with decanting older wines is sometimes those aromatics and that structure is really delicate. And so when you first open it, it smells amazing. And then it starts falling apart is what we call it. That's the term of just starts kind of losing its structure and all those flavors were so delicate and all of a sudden they're gone and you don't really get as much of the wine uh, anymore. So um, you don't wanna do loads of agitation on this wine. So don't like aggressively swirl the wine. If you're having difficulties getting a lot of the nose on this wine just because it's older. So swirl it a little bit, but you might even want to almost like put your hand on top of the glass Swirl it around so all those esters that are being released through alcohol evaporation are being trapped in the glass. And to further concentrate those effects, then you can take your hand off and get your nose right in there. That's going to really concentrate the effects of uh, those aromatics. It'll also give you a head buzz because uh, you're getting the concentration of those alcohol evaporated molecules as well. So um, this particular winery is so fun. So let me explain why it's really hard to find older wines in retail shops or restaurants in Virginia or other states that have similar alcohol laws as Virginia does. We are what's called a three-tier distribution state, which means I as a retailer, whether I work at a restaurant or a retail shop or a delivery person, I as a retailer have to buy wine from a distributor. I can't buy wine directly from a winery really frustrating. I can't also buy wine at auction and then resell it to you. You can do all of those things as a as a as an individual customer, but I cannot do that and then resell it. I don't have a reseller's distribution license. I just have a retail license. And so I have to buy from a distributor. Well, this distributor is buying it from the winery, but basically what they do is they fill their warehouse with whatever vintage is there. They're never gonna buy the next vintage until the previous vintage is sold out. And so they sell out of the vintages and are not maintaining inventory of older vintages in their warehouses. Um, oftentimes wineries aren't releasing enough of their older vintage, there's library releases, those older vintages, except to their wine club. So they're not releasing older vintages to distributors. So the distributor is not gonna hold on to these wines for 10, 15 years to then release it back to the market. That's just money hanging out on the shelves. The retailers and restaurants in the area don't have the money or time or space to do that either. And so we're usually selling wine that's not ready to drink, unfortunately, because that's what we can get our hands on. Um, so unless you buy it directly from a library release at a winery um, or as part of a wine club or something, or buying it through auction or someone else who's been selling it, it's harder to get your hands on older vintages. Here's an exception to this rule and here's why. So there's uh, this cult in California called the um, Fellowship of Friends. Um, really great name for a cult too, I love it. Pretty just like your typical hippy-dippy cult, like living on commune, live on the land, we're just gonna like 
um, be peace, love, and harmony, but you have to follow all of our rules and you can't leave kind of thing also. Uh, and they're right in this area um, on in the Sierra foothills of um, North Yuba. And um, this has been around since the 70s, 80s, it sounds about right. So Gideon, um, Gideon, oh my gosh, now I cannot remember his last name. Gideon Beinstock, uh, thank you, sorry, I uh, forgot his last name for a second. Gideon Beinstock moved there and he was like, great, y'all have some vineyards, I'll just make some wine for you because I'm a good winemaker and um, and we're, we're gonna make this thing happen. So living on this commune, they're making this wine uh, from a, a, a vintage, uh, sorry, a vineyard that became pretty famous thanks to this cult. The, vintage, uh, the vineyard is called the Renaissance Vineyard. So he starts making these Bordeaux style wines, whether they're Cabernet or Cabernet blends from this area in the late 90s. Well, about 2000, 2001, he was like, okay, y'all a little too weird for me. I'm gonna go purchase some other vineyards and make some other wines somewhere else. Peace out. Um, meanwhile, he's making these biodynamic wines from Closer Rome, if you've ever had their wine. So he's still hippy dippy, but he was just like not down with all the other cultist aspects of the Fellowship of Friends. Meanwhile, now that they don't have this really killer winemaker making all these wines, the vineyard just kind of went to disarray and, and no one was really making wine. So it went from about 500 acres to about 50 acres total um, and just kind of got overgrown and they really just made wine to drink, I'm sure for whatever uh, whatever rituals that they were uh, that they were doing with their with, with that wine. So just recently in the past few years, Gideon went back to them and was like, hey, what y'all ever do with all of my wine that I made? Like, I mean, a ton of cases of this wine. You weren't selling it. Y'all don't drink enough uh, to, to get to, to drink it all. Where is this? I'm like, oh, it's still here. It's been perfectly stored in our cellar on its side. Everything's fine. He was like, oh, can I buy that back from you? And they were like, yeah, sure. We'll take your money. So they were like, you can buy this much, but this much only of this vintage, of this vintage, and of this vintage. And he was like, okay, great. So he buys this back. Same bottle as this, just relabels it under his own name that he says taken from granite because all of these vineyards in this area, the Renaissance vineyard is all decomposed granite, thus the name taken from granite, um, and uh, literally relabels it and sells it to the market. So we are getting a 26-year-old Cabernet from a really amazing producer that that is now been just released to the market. It hasn't been hanging out on my shelf or a distributor's warehouse has been perfectly stored. A rare treasure to be able to kind of have this experience. That's why it doesn't cost a fortune. That's why you can get it through me. And um, But it is in this kind of like limited release. So he got like one batch of it. And then he went back and he was like, can I have a little bit more? And got another batch, but then they're like, no more. So we don't know if he's going to get another batch or not. But basically it's once it's gone, it's gone, and uh, it's not like the wine will be continued to be made because he only made it for about six years through them. And so some of the top restaurants in like New York City, uh, D.C., Las Vegas um, are pouring this wine by the glass while it's available, but it's not going to be available for long. So that's the story of this wine. This is the 1995 100% Cabernet Sauvignon Renaissance Vineyard from the Soleil actual like plot in there so um i love this story too when i found out about it i was like what is up with this wine why like i've never heard about a distributor releasing a 1995 vintage especially not at this price what's going on so it's really um really really fascinating lisa says i managed to get out with the coravin and the vintage needle okay fabulous um I am glad you did it when I when I sent that email out about be careful about the Coravin. I'm literally still cleaning up wine all over my uh, walls and um, and cabinets and uh, floors from a Coravin experiment gone wrong with this bottle. So sometimes as corks just age, they lose their elasticity, so they're not trying to expand as much. Um, and so you put a Coravin needle in there, pop a little bit of argon gas, and that increase in pressure will shoot the cork out with a lot of wine. So be careful using the Coravin with older wines, especially use the vintage needle when you can. Um, 
Uh, the cork was very soft. It broke. Yes. Um, yes, that does happen with older times. Sometimes you can get it crumbling. Let me show you a tool here. All right. So this is called an ah so um, because once you learn how it works, people say, ah, so that's how it works. So that's the name ah so. It's two prongs. So I encourage any of you wine nerds, if you're going to be trying more older wines, try and find one of these. You can pick them up for like five bucks at a Total Wine, um, and 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 it, it, they'll work perfectly. So one prong is a little bit longer, if you can tell this one here. This one's a little bit shorter. So say this still had a cork in it. I'm going to put one prong in, in between the cork and the glass of the bottle, wiggle it in, and then finally put the shorter prong in on either side, so about nine and three o'clock. Then I'm gonna take this handle and kind of saw it back and forth until I am now wiggling both prongs in between the cork and the glass. And then I'm gonna slowly twist up and it's gonna pull the cork up like so, rather than a screw, uh, like a wine screw going through the cork and making it crumbling. Um, and also will pull an older cork that's really crumbly out in one piece. This is actually this new patented thing called the Durand Wine Key, which is really phenomenal if you want to try it. You put the corkscrew in first, then the also goes on either side of the corkscrew. So it's kind of that double layer of protection. And you pull them out both together to make sure you can get out the oldest, most crumbly of all corks in one piece. So... Um, if it broke, don't worry. It's not a sign that the wine's actually corked or something's wrong. It could indicate that maybe the wine got a little bit too much oxygen, but um, usually just the older the corks get, the more crumbly they are. So um, let's get our noses in here and smell this wine. What? So here's an example of these esters that were always in this wine that are now fully released and ready to live their life because they're no longer bound up with the tannins. Then you're able to smell these things in, in wine that you weren't able to smell when the wine was younger. So typically, um, those esters are just gonna are gonna be a little bit on those all those tertiary flavors that we're talking about. There's also this formation of aldehydes, another chemical term, so I'm going into so much chemistry. But this aldehydes basically are these um, phenols, esters that are, that are formed with oxygen as it affects these esters. And those are gonna give you your nuttier components in your red wine, or your waxy, oily components in your white wines. They're used in soaps and perfumes a lot to give um, um, different flavors um, to those, um, not flavors like taste things, but um, aromatics to those. So aldehydes develop, but only with time. So that's why your older wines smell so different. Um, really, really fabulous. Ah, oh, man. All the fruit that's there, it's like if you took cherries and plums and maybe like raspberries and currants, you took them, you dried them out for, you know, 10 years, and then you like crumbled them up with some like dust uh, and then mixed it with some almond flour. That is what I'm getting. But there's also a lot of like these dried floral notes in the wine. And there's some um, peppery kind of component as well to it. Maybe even like a little bit of this eucalyptus or something um, mentholated as well. A lot going on, but definitely a lot of more delicate aromatics. Let's feel the texture of this wine in your mouth and think about the Cabernets that you've had that are younger Cabernets that might be like really aggressively tannic. As you taste this wine, Notice how silky the wine is in terms of tannins. The acid might be more pronounced because the fruit's softer, so it's not, not as much masking those acid compounds. But uh, the tannins will be silky. You're not going to get as much of that drying sensation in your gums.
<clears throat> I am still getting some tannins, but they're fine grained, they're silkier, and a little bit more elegant. So your overall proportions of wines from like acid, alcohol, um, all of those are going to be the same proportions even as the wine changes, but all of those things continuously change in the bottle. So wine is never static, it's this like living being, and during the process, uh, it's just hanging out in the bottle waiting for you to finally appreciate it. Um, those things are going to break down certain um, compounds and then bind with others. And then those things break down and bind. So you're going to have always the same amount of like acid compounds, if you could number them, or tannin compounds or phenolic compounds or even alcoholic compounds. But they just change the way they're bound in different situations and so that is why your your wine you could you could buy a million of these bottles from the same vintage and then taste one every single day and it will always taste slightly differently and that's the beautiful thing about wine is it's this like living being um, that is constantly changing and um, I think mean, it's just such a beautiful beautiful thing about wine so Let's see, question, is uh, is that a bit of anise I'm getting on the nose? Maybe eucalyptus. Yes, I, um, <clears throat> sorry, I think I, I um, got that, whether it's eucalyptus or something slightly mentholated, something like um, fennel, there's something green and lifted in this wine. Absolutely. Uh, love that. Uh, all right. So... Your actual thoughts on this wine now, especially if this is the oldest wine you've ever had, is this like, whoa, I didn't know wine could taste like this? Are you a little disappointed because the fruit's not there like it is in younger wines? Is this something that you um, appreciate and are going to look for more, you know, older wines? Or um, is, if, is this like not your thing? Please do tell me. Um, getting some black tea. I love that call. Yes. I love that, that call. It's definitely like this Earl Grey black tea, this very savory, uh, you know, great call on that, Lisa. Mmm. The wine is just so silky. I'm really, really enjoying this wine. Thank you all for, um, for uh, being a part of this uh, amazing experience and allowing me to call this work. I appreciate you. All right. Um, when you're ready, we're going to try the last one. I do want to leave enough time for questions because I know we talked a lot about a lot of different things. Um, so I don't want to, first of all, not give this our Pepe the time that it deserves to really experience and enjoy. And uh, if y'all had questions about other things that maybe we didn't go over, I could probably do a like four hour just lecture on how wines age um, and be perfectly perfectly still able to talk more at the end. Um, so I, I know I haven't covered everything, but I also don't want to overwhelm and get too luxury. So again, this is our Pepe, is the producer. We are in Lombardy, Italy. So we're in the north of Italy, but just to the east and north of Piedmont. Um, the area specifically is Valtellina. The DOC region, or DOCG region, sorry, is Valtellina Superiore, which just has higher levels of restrictions for how the wine is aged um, and, and made than just regular Valtellina. This is their Reserva, which indicates that the wine has extended oak aging on it, which in, it, it in fact does. This is the Sicella Cru, so that's the like area that it comes from, the small collection of vineyards. Um, as a crew, and the specific vineyard that it comes from is Roche Rose. So whenever you see two C's in Italian, it is a C-H sound. Um, but when you see a C-H sound, it's a K sound. So I know, confusing. But Roche Rose is the name of this actual uh, vineyard. So sell a crew. This is 2007 vintage. So uh, very few cases of this were produced. We are lucky enough to have some. He also only makes the single vineyard Reserva styles of his crew bottlings in the best of years. So um, between 2005-2010, he only made 
an 07 and an 09. So it doesn't make this every year. So you, you, you know when you're getting the single vineyard bottlings of his reservas of the cruise labeling that uh, it's, it's high quality stuff. So this is probably not gonna have the same amount of tertiary flavors as that uh, 1995 uh, Cabernet did, mostly because it's not as old. Also because Nebbiolo lasts forever. Nebbiolo has a very low pH balance, typically speaking, so higher acid levels. Um, it's also got lower alcohol content too, so after a certain alcohol percentage, your um, wine becomes volatile, which means it becomes a little bit more unstable. So typically speaking, the, the alcohol percentage that's the most stable to age your wine is about 12.5%. Too much higher than 13, and uh, hi, I have a little friend here to, uh, to join us. Callie wanted a little bit of wine. Um, and so typically speaking, if you are much over 13%, your wines become a little bit more unstable. If it's much under 12%, your wines can be a little bit unstable, especially if all the other things aren't together. So sugar acts as a preservative, which is why dessert wines, uh, even fortified dessert wines of very high alcohol contents, um, will last for years and years and years because sugar is a natural preservative. Um, also, um, higher alcohol content wines with sugar or lower alcohol content wines with sugar. So um, think your really sweet Rieslings or anything like that. It's just your 7% can last for decades and decades and decades. So alcohol is not the only factor that helps as a preservative. The phenolics are that come from the, the skin contact um, and the, the oak aging, the pH balance we talked about, um, and the, uh, the sugar content and the alcohol content. All of those things factor into the wine's actual stability even before you talk about how it is aged um, in terms of its storage condition, the temperature, the light, the vibrations, all the other things that we talked about. So the juice itself is most stable um, when it's got those higher acids, when it's got that medium amount of alcohol at 12.5%, if it doesn't have sugar to help it in uh, its various degrees. And so Nebbiolo, <clears throat> low sugar, but this wine is bone dry. And so it, it's gotta stay at that like good sweet spot. And this is technically says 13 and a half percent. That's uh, surprising to me. I thought this wine was a little bit lower than that, but um, 13 and a half percent. All right. So <clears throat> let's get our noses in here. You all know I love Nebula so much. Um, I got a chance to meet the winemaker um, of our Pepe a few years ago in Richmond. We did a whole like tasting of his whole portfolio. I traveled to Richmond to do this on my birthday. And so now I've made it like this tradition that every year on my birthday, I drink some Our Pepe wines and uh, it's a good excuse to drink just high in Nebbiolo and call it a tradition. So um, Rick says, does the maker of Nebbiolo age his reserva longer than his regular bottling? Yes, he does. So this wine, um, let me pull up the specific stats here because all of my notes are, um, let's see here, trying to figure out what he ages, how long he ages the, um, the other bottling here. So this was aged uh, four years in, in, in barrel and then three years in bottle. His other non-single um, vineyard uh, wines are aged, let me pull this up. Um, I can't get this immediately, sorry. Um, my computer can only do so many things at once. But generally, it's about, um, I think, three years in barrel and two years in bottle. So it's an extended year in barrel and an extended couple of years in bottle before he's releasing his reservas. Great question. Rick also says, California calves and Bordeaux seem to me to age differently flavor profiles. Any particular reasons? Part of that is just the winemaker. Um, part of it is the pH balance. So your California fruit is going to ripen more. And so as grapes linger on the vine and they're able to because of their warmer climate and stuff like that, you're not having to pick because it's about to become frost season. So you gotta pick earlier even though the grapes aren't fully ripe like sometimes happens in Bordeaux. As they hang out more, as the sugars continue to develop in the actual grape, 
the, sh the grape itself is using malic acid as an energy source. So your pH balance starts to go down in the grape because your overall total acidity or tartratable acidity is going down in the grape because it's using that malic acid as an energy source. So your California wines are just going to have a different pH balance. That's part of the reason. You're going to have a little bit of a higher alcohol content. Um, and... Um, there's a lot more I'm sure that goes into it in terms of just like how the wine was made in terms of the oak that was used and all of this stuff. Um, but my guess is one of the biggest things that is different is um, the aqua percentage and the pH balance of the wines. Um, that would be my guess. And just the idea that Bordeaux has kind of for generations now been making wines that they want you to age for that long. That was kind of not the original purpose of the wines in California. They were like, we're just wearing flannel shirts and jeans. We want you to drink these wines because they're delicious. And so I think part of it is just like the intention of the winemakers too when they're making these wines in California. Um, but that's not to say California wines don't age as long. Uh, I think one of the one of the two most exciting experiences that I've had in the last few years have been with California Cabernets age. There's a 1977 bottle of Camus Cabernet that I had here in this house. Um, and it was literally just the cheapest glass you can imagine, like what you'd get tube up chuck in. So like no punt at all, very, very thin, just green glass, like you would almost age a white wine in, and uh, very short cork. Um, cheap bottling, right? And they're like, there's no way this wine is going to be delicious. It wasn't there reserve or anything like that. And their special selection is regular Camus Cabernet. And it was stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, um, and so it's not to say that they don't age well. I just think that they age differently because of those things. So great questions, y'all. Um, all right, let's get our noses in here. And cheers, you all. Thank you so much for tasting these amazing wines with me tonight. I know it was um, definitely a, a different package price than I usually do in these classes, so y'all were brave. I appreciate it. Life is good. I love Nebbiolo. I love our Pepe. Holy still acid. Um, this wine is not showing its age at all. This wine is like no wrinkles on this baby whatsoever. Even at 14 years old, um, this could easily age for another 15, 20 years if you want it to. I think it's just going to get better. All the fruit to me is still a bit on the fresher side. So loads of cherries, like everything about Nebbiolo's cherry, 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 cherry pits, cherry stems, cherry skins, cherry, every, ch everything cherry, and lots of these like dried rose petal uh, floral aromatics as well. I don't get as much of that like road tar aspect that I often get with Nebbiolo's uh, from Barolo specifically. This is on the herbaceous, woodsy, very rustic style. It's very linear. It's very tightly wound up. Man, I decanted this and just put it right back in the bottle at about 4.30 this afternoon. And I almost wish that I had done it an hour earlier just to get it to loosen up a little bit more. Still pretty tightly wound. What are y'all experiencing in this wine? I know I don't want to hold you um, forever and ever, but I would like a little conversation about what you're tasting and smelling in this Our Pepe. <sighs> mm. Wow, really fascinating. One of the things that, um, that also changes the way um, red wines age versus white wines age, red wines are literally able to consume more oxygen. So by that I mean, Say you take this white red wine and this red wine. 
Wine goes up to here, then the cork goes in. There's gonna be a slight amount of oxygen in it. Red wine is able to basically like consume that without the oxygen changing the wine in a higher degree than white wines. So that's why generally speaking, red wines, one of the reasons why red wines age longer. That also because it has higher phenolics from the oak um, and those phenolics do help preserve the wine. Um, white wine um, doesn't have that, doesn't spend time with the skins of the grape. It often doesn't spend a lot of time in oak. So that changes things. So the pH balance isn't the only thing that matters, but it is one of the things that matters. So um, y'all are, are troopers for hanging in with all of this science talk uh, for an hour and a half on a Thursday. Um, oh, answered that question. Has anyone ever... Uh, I know some people have had our Pepe here before because I think I have sold it to y'all before. I did last summer, we did uh, one of their non-Reserva labelings. We just did from their Fiamo crew. Um, I'm sorry, their Inferno crew. Um, and uh, very long maceration. Absolutely, yes. 41 days this wine spent macerating on the skins. So uh, lots of time. So generally speaking, you're looking at two to three to four weeks um, on the skins. The juice spends on the skins. That's called the maceration process. Before it gets wrecked, the juice is removed from the pumice, the skins, and put into barrel or some other aging vessel. And this spent um, over the 30 days and well into 41 days that was this particular wine. So, But notice that the extraction is not a whole lot. So the longer that the wine spends with the skins, the more extracted the actual flavor, uh, the actual color of the wine can be. This wine doesn't have really deep pigmentation at all or deep concentration. That's because the Nebbiolo grape itself is a more palely concentrated uh, 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 grape skin. So the grape skins are thinner and they just don't have as many of those uh, pigment um, uh, components or compounds in the actual grape skins. Also, even young Nebbiolo will be this brown sometimes, but this is definitely showing the brown tinge coloring of the Nebbiolo grape along with uh, the 14 years age on it. So I'm going to enjoy this wine for the rest of the night and, um, and really continue to see how it's uh, developed and changed. Were there any other questions about how wines change, how maybe you can store your wine best. Obviously, we want to store the wine on its side. I don't want to do it all the way because I'm going to spill this wine. And that's because we don't want the cork to dry out. The cork dries out, then it starts crumbling, letting too much oxygen in. We don't want that. So we want the bottom of the cork to stay moist. But again, as wine ages or the longer it spends on its side, you're going to get um, cork moisture you know, will seep into, you know, the middle part of the cork, the longer it ages, all the way up to the top of the cork. So that's why it becomes crumbly, but that's much better than drying crumbly. So um, um, you want to make sure that the cork is staying moist, but you will see seepage of the wine out. We'd rather seep it, see seepage of the wine out than uh, the reverse, which is letting oxygen in. So you want to store your wines at about 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if you have a dual zone like wine fridge, then you can you can change the temperature to um, store your white wines a little bit colder so you don't have to put them in the fridge before you want to drink them. But no matter if it's white or red, you want to store it between 65 and, I mean, sorry, 55 and 60 degrees temperature. Um, you want to make sure that everything is stable. So it is better to store it at a slightly warmer temperature than, and, and that temperature be stable than to see fluctuations in temperature. It's the fluctuations in temperature that the wine does not like. It likes a stable environment. Um, you want a pretty good humid environment, so basements are great for that, right? Because they stay pretty stable in temperature. Um, they're pretty humid. Your wine fridges will, will have those. Um, um, again, um, you don't want tons of vibrations or, or light affecting it. So definitely not these like big fluorescent lights. Uh, LED lights are, are, are going to be fine um, as long as they're not like constantly shining on the wine or anything like that. Um, so just if you pop the wine in when you open the, the wine fridge or something, that's totally fine. You don't need to like store it in a, in a completely dark environment, but you want minimal light 
and uh, changes or fluctuations in any of those factors. So those are a few tips and tricks. Everyone get yourself an ASO or the Durand if you want the uh, the Mac Daddy of the uh, of the of the wine keys um, together. Um, to if you're going to be opening up some of these older corks, I highly recommend it. And if you're wondering about when to open up a wine, because it changes, right? All of these wines are continuously changing. So how do you know when a wine is at its peak? Maybe it started to go downhill in what we call a dumb phase right before it goes up again in terms of quality level. How do you know that? There's one really great resource, um, and that is sellertracker.com. I'll type that in the um, chat room here, seller hyphen tracker.com you can plug in any wine and the vintage and you have all these people who have been tasting it recently and have the date of their tasting note being like don't drink this wine right now or they might you know you might see 100 people who are saying like oh this wine's past this prime if you still have it just drink it you might see people being like oh this wine is in a dumb phase but it's going to get better so there's lots of other people who are tasting that exact wine, that, that same vintage and everything, and they have more current up-to-date notes on um, whether or not you should drink or hold. So highly recommend that as a resource if you're curious about some of the, uh, some of the um, wines that you might have in your cellar. So if there aren't any other questions, I don't see anything else in the chat room, um, then I just wanted to say thank you all for uh, sharing my birthday eve with me and uh, drinking these fabulous wines. And I look forward to um, hearing your thoughts later about uh, which one was your favorite. Please feel free to text me, of course, email me, Facebook, Instagram, anything, and tell me which one was your favorite. I really appreciate it. And especially all those who tuned in that didn't even have the wines, I really appreciate it. Kira, thanks so much for tuning in from California. I am um, uh, I am hoping to have a very um, relaxing weekend. Not tomorrow, I'm working all day, Friday, big delivery day and private events, but I am leaving town and going to sit on the beach and drink wine or maybe just tequila um, for a few days. So I will uh, be off the grid for a little bit. So um, thank you for all the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. And I um, look forward to seeing y'all again on the other side of next year of my life. So uh, until then, cheers, y'all. Have a great weekend. Bye.